Welcome to the startup presentations part of the, the MIT Japan Conference 2022. My name is Marcus Dolph. I'm a program director at the MIT Startup Exchange. Before I get going, I want to spend a few minutes or a few moments uh, covering the language instructions. To access the two sound uh, tracks, every attendee should choose either Japanese or English as their primary language. Please click on the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom window and then click on interpretation. You will then have the option to choose either English or Japanese. After each presentation, attendees can submit questions to the speaker. Click on the Q&A icon on your Zoom screen, then type in your question in either Japanese or English. Mention the startup name, please. So I'll give you a moment just to do that. All right, so let's spend a few minutes covering what the MIT Startup Exchange is and what exactly we do. Overall, our mission is to connect MIT startups to our corporate members. Today, we have approximately 1,400 active MIT startups. And each year, we make about 600 introductions between them and our corporate members. And these are targeted, highly vetted, high value introductions. The 1,400 startups come from all parts of MIT from all departments, employing all types of technologies to solve business problems across many, many different industries. The keywords that you see on this page represent some of the key, uh, some of the key technologies that they employ. All these startups are B2B and they have exceptionally strong technical founding teams. We're adding approximately 150 new startups per year. These are some um, recent success stories between our corporate members and um, our startups. These partnerships take many different forms. Sometimes it's a license agreement, sometimes it's a direct investment, or sometimes it's a more straightforward customer agreement. A few notes about how you might engage with MIT startups. Number one is attend events. Um, each year, we put on about 20 different events. Um, obviously, a lot of them are virtual today, but there are many opportunities to come to, uh, to MIT. We hope there, there, there will be opportunities to come to MIT in the spring. In the fall, we had a number of events live in person. You can also request meetings with uh, specific startups through your ILP program director. And then you can post um, an opportunity, meaning let's say you have a business problem that you're trying to solve. You can post this to our community of 1400 startups and that begins a selection process that allows the startup to apply to these opportunities. A few word, words about today's format we will have 11 startups presenting today, each presenting for about five minutes. Then that, that will be followed by about two minutes of questions. All these startups have been selected because of their strong business activity in Japan already, or because of their strong intent to begin operations in Japan. To post your questions, utilize the Q&A tool. You can post your questions in Japanese or English and we will answer as many as we can. Please mention the startup name in your question. After all the startup presentations, there, there will be breakout rooms, one per startup, and that's an opportunity for you to ask questions directly to each startup. We've already sent you the link in an email, and we will also post that link in the chat at the end of the startup presentations. Should you wish to be connected with a startup, you can either follow up directly with that startup or you can contact them via your ILP program director. Now with that, let's go to the first startup presenter, Alan Floor, Chief Revenue Officer of Pather. 
Alan, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen. And hopefully you're seeing it now. I am the Chief Revenue Officer. My name is Alan Floor at uh, Pather. Uh, our founder is George Shaw. He is uh, our CEO in MIT 2011. And our company, Pather, is a spatial intelligence company that takes data feeds from cameras existing on your sites and other sensors to identify the movement of people through space. Our tagline is, you could learn a lot from a dot. And as you can see from this chart, if you observe the motion of people and things through your spaces over time, those dots will tell you stories. They'll tell you about what's interesting to them and what's not interesting to them. They'll tell you about traffic patterns, where there may be congestion, where there may be opportunities to improve efficiencies and opportunities to improve effectiveness of that location, whether it's a selling location, a commercial office building or a factory or distribution center. Most companies have mountains of data right now that they're not using that has come from cameras, from sensors that were originally installed for loss prevention, but have never been used for any purpose beyond loss prevention. By harnessing the power of spatial intelligence, Pather utilizes those existing data sources to anonymously track the locations of people and things moving through space in real time. And because we use existing equipment and we're not requiring our customers to install specialized cameras or sensors like many of our competitors do, we're able to deliver a very fast time to value, typically less than 30 days and very strong financial results because there's almost no startup costs. We're able to deliver a 10X or more annual ROI for all of our customers. So again, Existing data sources on the left, cameras, but it could be anything like Bluetooth sensors and, and uh, card readers going through our software to drive real-time insights for your business. To bring this to life to you, I'd like to share a few case studies. The first is a retailer, and this is all about understanding customer and staff interaction. You're going to see one right there. The system is smart enough to understand when people are getting close enough and spend enough time together to count as an interaction. In this case, it's a retail store and they wanted to understand how their staff is interacting with their customers and how they can improve that. And what was interesting to them, if you look at this store, it happens to be a bike shop, a specialty bike shop. And on the right side, you see those blue and purple circles, which are the staff interacting with customers and with each other. And that happens to be where all the bikes are stored and where the service desk is. So that makes a lot of sense to them. But what was surprising to them is if you look to the left side, many, many orange circles, which represent customers working with each other, talking to each other about the products that are at that part of the store. That happens to be where the accessories are stored, the apparel and bike accessories, which have the highest margin in the store. So the insight for this retailer was if I could just train my staff to move over to that side of the store for just a little time during the day, they could drive incremental profitability by getting more of those high margin items sold. And that is exactly what happened when they implemented this. And that is why they are uh, at this moment expanding to all the stores in their chain as a result. This next use case uh, may be closer to many of your businesses. It's around factory and distribution center optimization. The idea here again is to leverage those existing cameras that are in place to predominantly for security reasons, but also other sensors. And in here we want to look at the risks of human and machine collision. In distribution centers and factories, we want to make sure that uh, people are avoiding things like fork trucks and automated guided vehicles, and there's enough space between them that we don't uh, have a risk of accidents. And we also want to remove congestion points to improve productivity. Uh, this one is just in flight now in market, and so we don't have results to share yet, but it's already very promising and uh, a very proven implementation in terms of the ability to leverage that existing infrastructure to solve new problems and drive new value in your locations. What we're looking for today from this group, uh, first and foremost, we're looking for more customers. We have over a dozen customers, so the system is out there. We serve large multinational companies and all of our customers right now are very large multinational companies. We have a current focus on retail uh, stores, malls, commercial real estate, and manufacturing and distribution. 
But as you can imagine, this is a pretty flexible technology. So if you have a use case that's outside those industries, we'd like to hear about that as well. If you think there may be a fit for your business, we would welcome an opportunity to have a discovery session with you to confirm that is the case. We're also looking for implementation partners. Uh, we're a small company. We don't have aspirations to grow into a very large company as it relates to people. So we rely on local market partners to give us that in-market presence and expertise. We have two active partners in Asia now. We're looking for more partners specifically in Japan and in the greater Asia to help us implement PATH or services. And then lastly, uh, we've started, we have a great strong base of early large enterprise customers. We are ready to expand. And so we're looking to expand again, not with our own resources, but through partners. So we're looking for selling partners in Japan and beyond, both companies that are interested in reselling our services as is, but also companies who are uh, interested in branding our technology as their own and selling it as their own under a, a white label. Those are the remarks I want to make. Thank you. I appreciate your time and would like to open it for any questions. Thank you, Alan. Let's uh, take a couple of questions here. So first question, as a customer, what kind of equipment would I need to buy or install to use your services at uh, one of my facilities? The only thing we require is a small server. And the reason we do that is we process the actual video on site. Uh, most companies don't have the bandwidth to ship video out over the web, uh, nor do they want to for privacy reasons. So we install a small server that processes the, the actual video and then sends a very small data stream of XYZ coordinates and timestamps uh, to our cloud at base analytics. So that's the only installation is that one piece of hardware. And the rest is just a video feed from the site already. Exactly. We plug into the existing systems. Great, great. Um, any additional implementation support for corporates or, or customers? No, not really. Once we have the server on site, uh, there's certainly a back and forth about what people want to accomplish in terms of use cases, but, but we've, we've grown this business in COVID. Everything we do can be done remotely and, and is done remotely today. Great, thank you. We're gonna go to the next speaker at this point, Keith Pasco, R&D engineer at Meter. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Keith Pasco. Uh, I am from Meter Parts. Uh, we are in San Francisco and Boston, uh, and we do CT. What is CT? Uh, it is computed tomography, where we take a series of X-ray images and stitch them together and create a full 3D internal imaging of any number of different parts, as you can see here on the left. Why would one want to use CT? Well, there's a number of different benefits of looking inside and seeing everything about something's internals. Um, you can look at fitment, for example, and alignment issues that you might not be able to see from outside. Uh, you can detect defects uh, such as cracks or pores, uh, and it also allows you to take measurements that you physically wouldn't be able to otherwise uh, because you can't access those areas uh, and compare them uh, manufactured to as designed, for example. And CT is actually incredibly useful across the entire range of a manufacturing life cycle. So in research and development, early staging, uh, we can use CT to inform design and manufacturing decisions uh, with low cost and rapid turnaround. Uh, when ramping up machining, we can ensure that the tooling uh, meets all of the design uh, specifications and tolerances. Um, during production, uh, we can play an essential role in quality control of things coming off the production line. Uh, and then finally, in post-production, a detailed 3D analysis of the results from these scans can uh, catch possible failure modes uh, over the life cycle of the continued product. Uh, and this is also just a small set of examples. Each individual customer uh, may have their own very unique needs for CT scanning. And actually at Meter, we pride ourselves on collaborating directly with our customers to uh, help them make the best products possible um, by using our technologies. 
So if CT is so useful, why isn't it more widely adopted? Uh, the biggest by far is the cost. Our competitors' machines cost into the millions uh, to operate and own. Uh, their machines also take up the size of a small room, uh, require very specialized uh, trained experts to install, operate, as well as analyze any of the data coming off. Meter, on the other hand, uh, we offer a fraction of the cost and a very low footprint, very minimal setup. Uh, our workflow from start to finish is very, very simple. Um, not only just installing the machine, but also being able to share and analyze data. Uh, it requires no installation of the software, no internal support teams to deal with it. All of our software is cloud-based, shareable, and easily expands. Um, and here is an example of our software at work. Uh, you can kind of see, we imagine a world where you can interact with CT data similarly to how you would a Google Doc, uh, where you can share, collaborate, make versions, uh, all from a maintenance-free web-based uh, in integrated interface. Uh, as an example, um, we had one company who started uh, using our product. Uh, they shared a scan data with engineers from many other offices and collaboratively, they found a number of voids in their product, shared that information with their manufacturing department who then changed their temperature and pressure settings in order to eliminate those void errors in the product. And actually within a week of shipping a machine, we had a tenfold increase in the number of engineers across the world that we were talking with uh, about our technology. Why we're specifically interested in Japan is because we believe that Japan has a very long uh, history of quality and reliability in manufacturing. And we believe that our product can help dovetail with those beliefs and further those traditions and values of quality and reliability. Um, and in addition, installing one of our machines in, for example, a US-based branch, um, our cloud-based software allows you to improve communication and collaboration um, due to the fact that everything is uh, in the cloud and shareable instantly. Uh, we are also open to vendor relationships with any suppliers of x-ray sources, cameras, uh, other hardware equipment, as uh, we are hoping to uh, help everyone make the best products that they can, we are also hoping to make the best product we can and continually trying to improve. Uh, thank you very much for your time and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Keith. I think the first question I'll ask is probably the question you hear a lot. And I think the first question I asked when I first heard the pitch of, of Mita from, from one of your founders, and that's what kind of parts can you scan and how large? Right. Um, so there are a number of different parts that we can scan and it, it kind of spans everything from a shoe to a spaceship um, in, in a certain way. We are limited to a cylinder that's 175 millimeters in diameter by 300 millimeters in height. Uh, and there are certain materials that are more difficult than others, very, very dense or very, very clear materials can be difficult, um, but it's metals, plastics, uh, rocks, uh, there's a, a whole world of different things that can be scanned. Got it. Um, and for someone that's not currently using CT, how might they benefit from your, uh, your products, your services? Help us understand think, additional use cases. Sure. I think the, the biggest benefit is that many people might actually want to use CT or have an application for CT, but don't have the ability to put up the capital or the room or the support that it takes. Um, and so we're, I think, less about creating brand new uh, CT things that have never been seen before per se, but enabling more people to scan more things at a lower cost and enable them to sort of not be afraid of looking into everything with CT, which is going to improve their reliability, quality control, uh, design, everything again, as I mentioned, throughout the uh, manufacturing process. Got it, got it. Um, another question from the audience here. Do you develop smaller CT hardware than ever? Um, how do you compare to existing solutions? Yeah. 
Yeah, so our, our footprint is is much, much smaller. Um, and we've put a lot of work into our engineering in order to get the largest scan volume possible um, while still keeping a small actual footprint of the machine, which is a lot of optics and, and engineering. Um, I can't say off the top of my head if there is a smaller CT scanner out there. Um, I don't know of it off the top of my head, other than a potentially microscope CT. Yeah. All right, thank you, Keith. Thank you. Let's go to the next startup. Fan Kuang Kuang, co-founder and CEO of Eureka Robotics. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kuang. Uh, I'm co-founder and CEO of Eureka Robotics. We are a robotics company based in Singapore. Uh, what we address is high accuracy, high agility automation. What is that? High accuracy, traditional robotics is very repetitive. Uh, for example, on assembly lines, those robots can achieve very high accuracy, but they are not high agility. If you change the car model, then you will have to reprogram all the robots on the assembly line. On the other hand, uh, warehouse picking robots have higher agility. For example, they can pick objects that are randomly placed or you know different objects without reprogramming but the accuracy is about one centimeter, which is, uh, which is uh, relatively low. Now, what we do at Eureka Robotics is we provide the technology to address high accuracy, high agility. So high accuracy here means typically less than one millimeter, sometimes even less than 50 micron. And high agility here means that the work pieces that we are working with can be random, can be in random initial positions. Um, so you can see here in the picture, uh, we are, many, for example, picking lenses that are very, very small, uh, about a few millimeters, and placed completely randomly uh, in a basket. So some of the use cases that we have in high accuracy, high agility, as I mentioned, uh, picking lenses that are used, for example, in telecom or in, in cameras uh, to clean them or to do the assembly. Um, so I'm just going to play the video here. Uh, currently, this robot has been deployed uh, in several uh, countries in the world, in Singapore, in China, and they have already picked more than uh, 1.25 million uh, times, uh, 1.25 million objects over the last year. Uh, we have developed several use cases in the optics manufacturing, and on the right, uh, we are also collaborating with uh, Denso, a Japanese company, uh, to uh, commercialize our technology in the force control. Um, what is what allows us to uh, to achieve high accuracy high agility are typically three things first of all is a uh, unique technology uh, to calibrate the full system from the camera to the robot endpoint which allows us to uh, to achieve 0 0.2 millimeter uh, with off the shelf cameras uh, we also have uh, deep learning computer vision that allows to uh, detect objects um, to be manipulated to be picked uh, with high accuracy and high robustness. And finally, uh, we have a unique robot uh, force control technology that allows the robot to, uh, to achieve extremely high accuracy when it comes to assembly or insertion in very tight, uh, for example, shaft in holes. Uh, we have um, strong uh, engagement already with Japan. Uh, so as I mentioned, we uh, just, um, commercialized our force control technology together with Denso. So our software will be installed on Denso robots. Uh, actually, the product was launched uh, uh, December last year. Uh, we have also collaboration here with uh, Sigma Koki. So our computer vision uh, software will be shipped together with Sigma Koki microscopes to detect automatically uh, scratches uh, on optical lenses. And finally, we are planning to open a uh, Japan office uh, this year. So what we are looking for um, uh, in terms of uh, partnership with uh, Japanese company companies is first of all, if you are a precision manufacturing company, for example, in automotive, optics, electronics, then uh, we want to help you solve the high accuracy, high agility automation challenges that you have in your production. And because so we are already working with a number of Japanese companies here in Singapore, but with our planned Japan office, uh, we will be able to help you uh, in the factories where you are in Japan. If you are a robot or camera manufacturer or a system integrator, 
we want to partner with you to combine, for example, our software with your hardware or uh, help if you're a system integrator, uh, help you address uh, high accuracy, high GE needs of your customers. So you know, if you have um, uh, any uh, such requests uh, or possible partnerships, I'll be, I'll be very happy uh, to answer the questions and feel free to contact us at the, at the email and in the chat session. Thank you. Um, talk to us a little bit about the actual product that a customer would be buying. Yeah, so uh, the, what, right now, um, at, at first, we um, make the full uh, systems integrating robots that we buy off the shelf, cameras that we buy off the shelf, and we put our software, and we deliver the whole system, turnkey system, to our customers. And we keep doing that. Mm -hmm. However, what we're adding now is we are selling also uh, the uh, controller itself, uh, and we are making it so easy that anybody, any system integrator can take our controller and develop the applications, the high accuracy, high agility, haha applications by themselves to serve their customers. And third, uh, we are open to partnership where uh, we work with, uh, you know, uh, robot manufacturers, camera manufacturers, so that they can integrate our software and sell them together with their products. Please expand a little bit about what you see as the, the differentiation of, of your technology versus what's in the market today. Uh, so in the market today, uh, there are a lot of companies, for example, who are specialized in uh, warehouse fulfillment, uh, bin picking. So those companies have this uh, vision guided. Uh, so we can say that they are high agility because they can pick different objects and the objects can be randomly placed, uh, but they cannot achieve super high accuracy for example, sub-millimeter accuracy, which is needed uh, when uh, you're not in warehouse, but if you are on the production shop floor, uh, typically, you know, assembly task or uh, installation of uh, electronics components, all of those uh, tasks require sub-millimeter accuracy, which existing robotics startups uh, besides Eureka Robotics have uh, difficulties doing. Got it. Thank you. Let's go to the next startup presenter. That is going to be Koda Weaver, co-founder and CTO of Skyla Technologies. Yeah, so you can hear me, I think so. Okay, great. Uh, so thanks for joining me. Uh, again, I'm Koda Weaver and I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders of Skyla Tech. Uh, and our MIT connections are uh, Professor Harry Yasuda who teaches robotics there and also uh, Dr. Sheng Liu, who is a, uh, well, he has a PhD from MIT in robotics as well. Uh, so Skyla's goal is to make robots work more safely and more effectively by better understanding how people move and interact. And this can really be applied to a pretty wide range of different areas, but we're currently focused on the manufacturing setting. And there's really been this increased demand for uh, automation, especially with the global pandemic. And in addition, we found that a lot of customers um, really want frequently changing floor layouts uh, because they have different uh, parts that they might want to be manufacturing. And these, this is often in spaces where there are also people working uh, with the robots. Um, and then again, like the uh, sub-millimeter precision is actually a big need as well. Uh, very often customers need high precision and we found that none of the existing robots uh, actually meet all of these requirements. Um, so we put together a controller, uh, which can be integrated into either new or existing vehicles and robots as, uh, as sort of the brain of the operation. Um, and so by combining onboard sensors, such as cameras and LIDAR, along with our proprietary algorithms, uh, we can actually allow these robots to map out and navigate a customer's environment. And then once we've reached a goal, uh, then we can perform various manipulation tasks and also carry objects from place to place. Um, so this is all made possible by teaching uh, robots how people move around uh, using machine learning. And by better understanding how they move, uh, we can both move most more effectively um, and also more safely. Uh, we also provide about a 0.3 millimeter uh, endpoint positioning accuracy. Uh, so we do have a number of customers in Japan. Uh, this includes DMG Mori, who's the world's largest machine tools company. Um, and DMG Mori uses 
our Jetstream Core uh, controller as its navigation platform for the WH AGV5. Uh, so that's been deployed already in a number of factories around the world, including in Japan. Um, and we're also helping DMG Modi release additional products around this. Uh, we also do have robots in JRE's train stations. Uh, so currently we're pilot testing some guidance and data collection robots in Takanawa Gateway Station. Uh, and so that uses our human aware navigation technology. And so if you visit that station, you might find our robots driving around. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we have that Jetstream Core robot controller as one of our products. And then we also have a fleet management server. So with these two things, uh, you can manage your robots and also basically synchronize them and make sure that they're doing the right things. Um, and then we also have a new compact mobile manipulator coming. So we found that a lot of our customers uh, feel that the existing mobile manipulators out there are too big. So we're trying to build something a little bit smaller that can fit in tighter spaces. Um, so this is a good fit for factories in Japan as well as in other places. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have substantial experience uh, working with customers in Japan, and uh, we're actually planning on opening a branch office in Tokyo this year. Um, and typically when we work with customers, they might send uh, an engineer to work with us for anywhere from a couple months to a year, or uh, you know, we've, also, uh, we've also worked with them uh, on a yeah, less, uh, basically just by providing frequent site visits uh, to provide some support. And also we wanna make sure that we understand our customers' needs. Um, we try to work very closely with our customers uh, to help them integrate. Um, so that's, and that's very, very important to us. Uh, so we're currently looking for some strategic partners uh, to develop some new mobile manipulators uh, as well as retrofit to existing platforms um, and actually in general uh, vehicles. Uh, and we're looking at a few different areas. Uh, in particular, I think the indoor and outdoor hybrid use cases are something that we're very interested in, as well as clean room applications. Um, and then we're also looking for early stage customers for our new human aware AGB. Um, so again, I'm Coda Weaver, uh, and my contact information is below. Uh, and thank you very much. Coda. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you integrate with the uh, existing systems. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we do have experience integrating with basically existing uh, factory infrastructure. So we've integrated with, for example, DMG Modi's uh, Matrix product line, um, as well as you know, various PLCs and things like that. So we actually have a pretty you know, of course, we don't have complete coverage of, or anything, but uh, we do actually have experience working with a pretty wide range of PLCs and also uh, other systems to help better integrate our controllers uh, and our robots to existing factories and, and vehicles. What about the human safety component? Yep. So uh, we've, yeah, of course, naturally, we've worked pretty closely with uh, at with various uh, state or standards groups and things like that, um, as well as uh, some like testing sites. And uh, in addition, um, yeah, I, we, yeah, we've, yeah, there, there are pretty wide range of different safety standards that we go through um, to make sure that these things are safe for human use. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, naturally that's a very important right. part of integrating these into a factory. So, yep. Understood. Uh, so let's pause here. Let's go to the next startup. Thank you. That's going to be uh, Brian Alessi, VP of Marketing at Everactive. Thank you, Marcus. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you go, can you all hear and see hear me and see my screen? Yep. All right. Go let's ahead. get into it. I'm, I'm Brian Alessi. I, I head up marketing at Everactive. So what? is Everactive, if you're unfamiliar. Everactive is the self-powered IoT platform for hyperscale data acquisition. So what do we mean by that? We mean being able to collect and manage massive amounts of physical world data that we all know is uh, incredibly valuable, but at the same time has been incredibly challenging to get in a cost-effective and uh, really easy, easy to 
to obtain whey. So how, how have we done that? Fundamentally, uh, we're able to make that claim because we've solved some really challenging technology problems. So um, with custom semiconductors that operate at a thousand times lower power uh, than what you can get off the shelf today, we've been able to uh, develop completely battery-free wireless sensors that are always on, continuously monitoring, continuously transmitting data uh, from very small form factor, wireless and battery-free devices. What we believe that that unlocks and is already unlocking for our customers today is the ability to deploy sensors at a scale that's just not possible if you have to think about batteries or wiring uh, devices. Uh, what we've done with that as a company is we, from that, that custom silicon that was actually developed uh, dating back to the days of our co-founders at, at MIT, uh, we've developed a, a real data acquisition platform and if we move to the, to the right quadrant here, you can see we've proven out the value of that platform by ourselves, ever active, developing two very specific use cases and applications to begin with. So uh, those are specifically a steam trap monitoring product and a vibration monitoring product for motors, pumps, uh, rotating industrial equipment. You can see some of the logos there that we've uh, been able to win and expand with over the past couple of years. But the, the very exciting thing uh, that is exciting, but the more exciting thing to come over the coming uh, uh, year is this bottom piece now poised to enable entire industries to innovate uh, and really usher in this ubiquitous computing revolution. And the way we're going to do that is by opening up the platform uh, to other developers, enterprise developers, large customers to be able to develop battery free products on top of the Everactive platform. So that's a pretty bold claim, the ubiquitous computing revolution, right? Sort of lofty claim. But uh, the way we think about the world is that each of the computing revolution, revolutions over the past few decades fundamentally are about two things. It's about uh, fundamentally new pieces of hardware being able to access and uh, generate fundamentally new streams of data. So we see that uh, from the, the PC era, just connectivity sort of in its initial phases, going through uh, the mobile era, right, about being able to put those computers in our pockets and have access to just, just vastly new uh, and, and high volume data. And then moving into sort of the early stages of the IoT, the Fitbits, the sort of connected wearable and home devices, now to being able to think about connectivity as you know, one device per thing out there in the world. And that is what we view as really getting to the true promise of this IoT that's been talked about for so long. Uh, fundamentally, you might've been, been reading these. We think uh, there have been some key challenges uh, in getting there. First and foremost, of course, you heard the battery free theme. Uh, we think getting rid of the battery uh, is absolutely critical to achieving that vision. Uh, but there are also some other things tied up in there, the wireless networking, being able to have reliable, long range, high density wireless networks that don't crumble uh, at, you know, tens of devices per gateway and, you know, tens of meters per, you know, range from gateway to device. Uh, the third bullet here is making all of this uh, very easy to use and easy to integrate, right? Um, for, for folks who operate manufacturing plants, they shouldn't have to worry about, you know, getting a doctorate in wireless communication and, you know, semiconductors in order to, to have a meaningful system that gets them data that they need. And then, of course, being able to demonstrate, um, you know, real quantifiable savings uh, to customers. So we talked about the platform. Here's a bit of a, a double click on what that actually looks like. Uh, the platform from Everactive standpoint consists, of course, of battery-free hardware. Think of that as the data acquisition layer. Uh, then a managed network data uh, layer. Think of that as a data services layer. And then the application layer, which is really where the developers get to have fun and to innovate and, and really start to bring new value to their customers. And we've packaged the, the green bits here as a managed network in large part to make it easy for customers who don't want to have to worry about uh, integrating all of these pieces together. Uh, conscious of time, I'll, I'll jump through. Uh, so Everactive focuses its innovation now on successive generations of its chip technology and its wireless networking technology. So you can see some of the specs here, but the vectors we push on between each of these generations is lowering the power requirements so that we can harvest energy from scarcer and scarcer sources. So the light in you know, my, my very dim office right now would be enough to continuously power uh, our generation of devices out there today, improving the wireless range and then expanding 
uh, the different sensors that we can interface with, all in the name of being able to uh, collect more and more data uh, using scarcer and scarcer energy and transmit that uh, more reliably uh, back to where it needs to go so that our developer community can, can build uh, high value applications on top of that. What we're asking for here today uh, specifically is, is of course always looking for customers of our, our current two products, but uh, specifically now partnerships for we'll call it the, the platform service uh, companies and organizations who are looking to uh, build for themselves innovative battery-less uh, solutions to take to market. So with that, I think I probably ran over, but. We have a little bit of time for, uh, for questions here. Uh, so maybe as a starting po point, tell us what's unique about your technology. Um, what are the, what are the things that stand out? Yeah. So fundamentally, it's the innovations at the semiconductor level, uh, notably related to power and wireless networking. So we've we've lowered the power requirements uh, for always on devices uh, in the you saw in the tens of microwatts. So what that enables us to do is generate power from. Those, those scarce sources you saw uh, on the last slide. Uh, I, I think the a very important point to hammer home though, it's so it's battery-less and always on, right? Uh, it's easy to make a battery-less system. You know, I, you could take one of those solar panels from the highway and you can measure a temperature point and transmit data once a month. That's a battery-less system, but it's not super functional and super scalable. So we've cracked the nut of uh, getting rid of the battery and continuous uh, data transmission. And so very briefly, what are the use cases that you solve that others cannot? Yeah, so the, the real sort of sweet spot use cases for us are related to scale. Um, mm -hmm. So if you have a facility where you want to put 10 sensors, you want to monitor 10 pieces of equipment, you can probably tolerate changing out 10 batteries. Uh, if you have a refinery or a manufacturing facility where you want to monitor thousands upon thousands of different data points, you cannot tolerate from a logistical or financial standpoint uh, replacing batteries. So that's kind of our, that's what we solve for. And then it's kind of plug and play from there in terms of, well, I want to measure vibration or temperature or humidity. Uh, Got it. Uh, we're running out of time. I see a question uh, in, the, in the chat here. Maybe perhaps you can answer that directly, Brian. I want to encourage everyone to post your questions in the Q&A tool, ideally, or in the chat in English or Japanese, and we'll try to answer them. Um, and also, just to let you know that if we don't get to your question, you can join us in the breakout room at the very end, and you can ask your questions directly to each startup. We're now going to go to our next startup presenter, and that is Munihiko Sato, co-founder and CTO of MuiLab. Okay, um, yeah, okay, thank you for the introduction. So, hi everyone, so I'm Munehiko Sato. Can you uh, hear us? Yes. Okay, so I'm CTO and co founder of Mui Labs. And I used to be a research scientist at MIT Media Lab years ago. So, at Mui Labs, we provide IoT platform and interfaces that enables calm digital living. So digital technology has made our lives so easier, yet devices and interrupt our lives and constantly and compete for our attention. And digital uh, applications and devices uh, literally cut into our lives and moments and, and threatening our most valuable moments with your loved ones and by yourselves. The challenge is how can we take control of your calm moments without losing the convenience of digital technology? So we provide Mui platform, so along with our iconic smart home hub, a wooden smart home hub, Mui board. So it provides a comfortable balance of digital life and analog life. The Mui board shows an only minimum amount of information and quietly and softly. So the lady is looking out of the window, so she might be thinking about someone important. So we believe that technology should not get in the way of people but rather humbly stay aside and provide only essential minimum amount of uh, assistance to people. So here's more details about our products. So we provide a smart home hub with a 
elementary features for people's lives, like communicating with your family members using text, voice, and also handwritten messages, and controlling IoT devices like light bulbs, music streamings, and air conditioners, and essential utilities like weather forecast or you know, night timers and meditation light. So here's some example of, of uh, the apps and uh, it's light dimming timer. That's a bit unique in interface with a touch interactive wooden surface. So you can draw a single line and the length of the line becomes the length of the timer and it dims the light bulb slowly. So it's perfect for you know, winding down and reading a book before you go to sleep. Or, and so you or maybe your little kid can send a handwritten message to your you know, loved family member, uh, also adding your personal touch. So it's pretty simple that you, know, you can send such messages and then you know, we have a, com a companion app and then you can receive the messages, uh, for example, when you're at the office. So our business is not selling this, uh, you know, Mui board hardware to consumers directly, but providing this uh, Mui IoT platform to our B2B customers. So we have a design and technology platform to enable this calm and unique user experience. And it's backed by our patented hardware structure and manufacturing processes, but also vertical integrations of IoT hardware, uh, cloud structure, and the API integrations and UI UX designs. It's all centered around the concept of providing a calm user experience. So there are mainly like two forms on how we serve customers. The first shown on the left. So we customize and tailor finished products, including hardware, software, and cloud. So such customers include like house providers or real estate agencies and infrastructure providers. So they have uh, these clients have uh, consumer customers like home buyers or tenants. So we provide uh, customer relationship and engagement platform uh, connecting to their uh, end users. And second, on the right side, so we license our technologies and design stacks, including you know, IP patents, uh, supply chains, and SaaS backend, and UI UX assets, so that our B2B customers can make their products now come out. <clears throat> so we have been working with a variety of collaborators <clears throat> and clients, including like high-end high furniture brand Casino or retail store, <clears throat> like uh, Nakagawa Masashi Shoten, and co-working space or you know, housing makers, hotels, and office complexes. So we've been working with more than like 70 clients, Japan and worldwide, but I highlight, highlight some of the collaborations here. So first of is Wacom, so it's, it's a reading touch stylus provider. So we create new digital ink pro, uh, products for home and living market. Uh, it's wooden pillar and it is scheduled to release uh, this year. So with Jibun House, it's a Japanese house provider. We built a partnership with them to include our uh, you know, Mui board and, and you know, Mui platform to all of their houses, you know, Kikaku Jutaku in Japanese to provide better and streamlined smart home experience. Third, we worked with Alexa uh, that, uh, to build a custom Alexa experience. It's a hybrid of voice UI and minimalistic touchscreen interactions for some Alexa skills like you know, timers and light controls. And finally, with SAP, uh, we integrated their uh, Quadrix uh, customer experience platform um, with Muibor, and customers can leave handwritten feedbacks to Muibor. And, our system recognized that text and then you know transfer that to the SAP uh, database and then ca can run the analysis for the you know business intelligence and so on. Okay, uh, to wrap up, so we are looking for the partners. Uh, first, uh, companies who like to uh, use Mui uh, 
you know, our cloud and customer engagement apps to their consumer and the users. And second, uh, companies who like to use our uh, tech and design stacks to make their product come. And last but, last but not least, so we are looking for uh, strategic manufacturing and supply chain partners uh, for uh, Japan and the uh, North America uh, market. Uh, thanks all for, I'm happy to answer questions if you have. Great, thank you, Muna. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about how one should think about the difference between your platform and other existing IoT platforms. Yeah, so our platform is really focusing on providing a calm UI and you know calm user experience. So we have you know basic all the kind of same levels of the uh, functions and reliability of IoT platform existing out there, but uh, we think uh, you know. It's our complementary technology, like for example, you know, for when you are at the, say home office or maybe at the office, so they can use some existing like Alexa or Google Home or other IoT platform. But when in bedroom or maybe your time with your children, you want some something different. So we think it's it's complementary uh, uh, IoT platform uh, specialized for uh, you know family and uh, kind of calm moments. Got it. Thank you. Let's go to our next startup presenter, Li Feng Wang, co founder and CEO of Ion Technologies. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus. I'm going to share my screen. Um, see it all right? Um, hello, everybody. My name is Li Feng Wang. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Eon Technologies, Inc. I co-founded the company with Professor Ji Li uh, of Department of Material Science and Engineering at MIT, and also uh, Professor Sa Li uh, of Material Science of uh, Tongji University. And uh, Professor uh, Ji Li and Professor Sa Li have uh, collaborated over the last six years to develop this technology. Um, Eon uh, produces a high performance RFP battery cathode material through recycling uh, spanned RFP material from used uh, retired uh, EV batteries. And our method can cut the cost of producing new uh, RFP cathode material by 70%. And the process also reduces the CO2 emission by 90%. The global uh, um, RIB, the lithium on battery market size, uh, is growing very rapidly. And this year, it's going to reach $30 billion. And the amount of decommissioned battery has, is also increasing exponentially. And this year, just the, uh, the cathode material, uh, RFP cathode material itself is going to reach over 150,000 tons. So the battery, uh, you know, once it's uh, retired from the cars, uh, you know, our storage system um, is collected and shredded and grinded, and the material inside is separated into like copper, graphite, aluminum, and the remaining black mass, which contains lithium, is what we recycle and reprocess. So it becomes becomes a new RFP material and can be used uh, again to build new batteries. And the current existing uh, traditional method of recycling, there is annealing, uh, which is one kind of uh, direct recycling. There is a hydro process recycling. There's also the pyro process recycling. And all three of them, if you look at the chart, um, they create a, a lot of uh, um, CO2 emission is actually more of the same amount of uh, emission and uses the same amount of energy um, as generating brand new air free material. So it's costly and also not very environmental friendly. And if you look at the environment, uh, environmental impact, um, you can see the difference between our direct recycling where our technology and the other methods. So we estimate right now there are only less than 10% of 
uh, batteries being recycled as of today. And versus you know, the traditional car battery, the, the lead acid battery, already 99% of a recycling ratio. So there's a long way to go. We estimate that by using our technology, uh, by 2030, we can reduce the CO2 emission by 400 million tons and reduce environmental hazard waste by 42 million tons. So the, the car battery, once it's retired in the, uh, the, the RFP material, there's only 20 to 30% of it that failed. The other 70 to 80% are still good to, to be used. But the traditional method of recycling, they uh, regenerated, reprocessed 100% of it. And this is a deep recycling. It's a, a very costly and um, uses a lot of energy and, and generate a lot of emission. So our solution is we call it targeted repair. We only repair the 20 to 30 percent of it that's failed instead of um, you know, processing the good, the good part of it too. And we call the process light recycling. And this is our product, finished product. If you look at the uh, graph, the energy density, the cycle life, and the uh, fast charging capability, they are all uh, either at par or superior to the commercial grade RFP available on the market of today. And uh, currently, we, are, uh, we already built our first uh, test production pipeline. And uh, uh, our goal, um, we are on track to go into limited scale mass production in the second half of this year. And uh, we are starting to plan a bigger, much bigger factory so we can get into um, large scale mass production in 2023. They're also working on the development of recycling NCM batteries, uh, in addition to RFP batteries. The technology we estimate will mature in the second half of this year. And we plan to build one or more factories in Japan, because Japan is a large market for EV and batteries, and uh, to do the recycling job there. And we would like to partner with uh, Japanese battery recycling companies, so we can buy the, the spent black mass material from them. And we would like to partner with the Japanese battery manufacturers so, so we can sell them our newly generated uh, cathode material so that they can build more uh, new batteries. That's it. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Li Feng. Maybe start by summarizing some of the, the key benefits of your technology compared to what, um, what exists on the market today. I think, you know, it cuts the cost dramatically, right? 70%, uh, you know, our cost of processing is 30% of others are using today. And that's due to, we use much less energy. And then we generate much less emission. So uh, I think, you know, we, we provide a much cheaper, um, in a way, much cheaper material to the new batteries mm -hmm. by recycling the used one. Got it. Yeah. Um, where are you looking to do your production line? The first production line we're building it in China, and uh, which, which is the largest uh, market for RF, RFP uh, batteries, and uh, so um, uh, and it's going to remain the largest battery uh, market uh, manufacturing base probably in the in the long future. So that's where we're building the first factory, and then we uh, once that's up and running, we finish uh, the pipeline and we figure out all the solve all the small issues. Then we're going to expand. We're going to build our second one in the U U.S. And we would like to build one in Japan. And we have investors uh, from Korea that they are uh, talking to us about building one there. And of course, in Europe, we would like to, you know, we, we think this is a breakthrough technology. And we would like to um, like it to benefit, you know, uh, the entire world, wherever there's a need for battery recycling. Got it. Thank you. Let's Thank go you. to our next startup presenter, Jifei Wu, founder and CEO of OPT Industries. Hello, everyone. And I hope everyone can hear me. Well, I'm going to share my screen as well. Okay, so uh, 
Um, hi everyone, my name is Jifei O. Oh. I'm founder and CEO of OPD Industries. Jifei, so, can, can you put it in? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Is it full screen? Awesome. Yeah. Um, so OPD Industries, um, uh, what we do, we are a material and manufacturing company. Um, so we build additive manufacturing, hardware, software, and polymer system um, to help us to uh, developing new type of materials faster um, and also uh, making the material manufacturing more scalable and also uncover new materials that were not possible before. Um, so when we're talking about materials, of course, depending on what kind of like background you are coming from, it might mean like something a little bit different for us. The materials mostly specifically focusing on uh, soft goods such as foam, textile, fabric, um, uh, you know, most of the things that we've been using uh, from day to day basis. And then if we're really looking into how nowadays we manufacturing those kind of like a soft goods materials, it's actually quite complicated. So this is a very simple example of a, uh, a, a, a testing swab. And if we do anatomy on this swab, we can really see that each company components and parts uh, went through a quite long uh, supply uh, chain and then really from like a beginning, like a very small, like a scale of the fiber all the way to larger scale uh, to fabric in the end to cut and sew to make the finished goods. And then the problem with this kind of like a, a current like a conventional pipeline is that really makes uh, any kind of like a new material property discovery or a, a, a development uh, uh, relatively long, but also uh, uh, you know, like in order to basically make any new inventions, like there's quite of like a high uh, a, a capital requirement to purchasing all of those kind of like expensive equipment. So what we're really thinking about, you know, the future of the material manufacturing should be digital. What we mean by that, instead of like a materials property is solely on uh, uh, relying on the chemical and also mechanical uh, processes, it can be, it should be dig uh, designed and simulated uh, digitally and algorithm algorithmically. Instead of like looking at a different materials needs to be produced by different processes and different machines, you should be able to produce in the unified single process, one, one process, multiple different material structures that can be produced. And because of that, third point is that that really allows the scale of the manufacturing become more dynamic. So basically, if we wanted to have a largest production or small production, we don't need to basically like investing a large, very expensive uh, 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 manufacturing equipment. So this is basically uh, what we're building in terms of the technology. So there are a lot of things that we can talk about on this kind of like a new type of like a additive manufacturing system. But three main takeaway uh, from today is that, so this is the first of all, this is the world first row to row based an um, additive manufacturing system. As you can see here that we can produce in the very, very precise at the scale of micron uh, 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 material structures, but instead of like a conventional additive manufacturing system that is a batch to batch process, uh, this is a truly row to row process, which means that we can produce materials in unlimited length that not only allow us to tap, uh, tap into applications requires a larger format, also really automate the process really easily. Uh, second is that, um, you know, as you can, uh, uh, sorry, this one is not looping. So I'm gonna basically put it back in again. But really beyond like, uh, besides the uh, this foam structure you can show here. So if you see my uh, video that, that there are different material structures such as this kind of like a micro pillar, uh, first, full first structures, uh, this kind of like a spacer fabric, um, or even something much longer, like, a, a, you know, like a weaven ribbons that we can create. So again, this is to the second point is that one manufacturing machine platform allows you to uh, uh, manufacturing okay. different material uh, uh, structures in the, uh, on the same platform. And third point, point is that we have a, a fully end-to-end -end digital uh, from design to manufacturing process inter uh, integrated. Uh, what I mean by that, if you're thinking about really um, design and modeling a sweater that you're, uh, you are wearing from the scale of each individu individual fiber, uh, you will find that it's impossible to do because there's no uh, digital modeling software, uh, CAD software will al really allow you to do that. So what we do is that we really have our own data structure file format to allow us to really modeling material from a very, very, like a, a very, very small scale and to the large scale really allow us to really like a, a design and engineer to design the material functions like in a very deterministic way. 
So what this platform can do, this is like one of the application example that we can see here. So essentially, this is a, a, a medical swab where it shows that it has a much faster weakening uh, a property because of the capillary forces we can tune. But not only that, and also we can sort of like uh, design the pore size in a, in a sense that it's also big enough that when you put it into the reagent, it can release the, uh, um, the, uh, your samples like uh, very effectively. Now, of course, this such a product is, was very uh, timely in the peak of the pandemic because this is much needed for a diagnostic but really the idea behind it is that because we can start really designing in such a fine scale you're not really designing for shape right you are designing the material properties in a very deterministic way um so yeah so in the past year uh, we've been very lucky uh, have been uh, some engagement with uh, some um, uh, japanese uh, uh, business partners uh, uh, mostly in the packaging and, and uh, cosmetic and also diagnostic uh, diagnostic side uh, uh, and then the way we're engaging with our customer is that instead of selling them equipment or software, we are actually their um, a, a prototyping and a manufacturing partner. So they came to us with a uh, certain like a material challenges or requirement in their current process. And then we basically work together to see how our platform, hardware, software, and polymer platform can provide a solution for them. So really like, you know, like as I said, right, like uh, this kind of uh, absorbent, uh, uh, the uh, applicator medical swab is just really tip of the iceberg the a few things things that we can do um beyond that you know things like uh, uh packaging insulation acoustic material filtration mechanical adhesion such as like a velcro different three-dimensional velcro or cushioning materials so those are things that we've been already working on and by the way those are real photos coming from our like machines like a not like renderings um so yeah so very excited to um looking forward to um uh, 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 having the opportunity working with the uh, uh, japanese partners one of the really Really main uh, uh, ex things that are making us really excited about this opportunity is that we know that like really uh, Japan is really known by the precision machining and the process and then we're really looking for like how our like a micron scale uh, precision like uh, um, additive manufacturing process would be able to benefit uh, really like in the uh, material innovation side. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Jifei. Um, a few questions, perhaps. W what is the typical input material? So we are mostly right now focusing on uh, uh, photopolymers. So it's a thermoset uh, uh, polymer. Um, right now, we actually have a quite a uh, focus on how we can increase the uh, um, uh, 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 plant-based uh, 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 raw material into our formulation and composition. So this is one of the things looking at uh, from the sustainability perspective. You know, like if we're talking about additive manufacturing in plastic, most people are concerned about the, the sustainability. And this is basically one thing we've been working on, like uh, increasing the bio content in our input material. Got it. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about the use cases. What are the potential applications? Yeah. So as you can see here that, you know, what we see here is that we're basically developing different type of like a material has a certain functionalities, right? Like absorbent cushioning or even thermal insulation. So a few applications in the uh, medical and the diagnostic obviously is looking at how we can develop a new type of applicator swaps for better, you know, like a high sensitive diagnostics. In the cosmetics, we are looking at developing new type of a cosmetic applicators such as mascara brushes or foundation pads and like all of those that can better release fluid or particle uh, uh, cosmetic product on human faces um, and we're also looking into automotive where we can basically really if you're thinking about automotive or other type of cushioning material if you need a different breathability or bouncing cushioning you need to basically have a cut and sew process right we're looking at it now you can design all of those structures in and producing one go how we can really reduce the assembly cut and sew assembly process uh, assembly process in the manual manufacturing uh, uh, line, yeah. Okay. We have a couple of questions uh, written in Japanese. So I'd like to get a translation for those and we can try to answer them. So let's try for the one in the Q&A tool first. Jifei, can you can you hear that? Yeah, um, I think I heard that it, that was in Japan, Japanese. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the translation is uh, 
talk to us about the speed of manufacturing. How quickly can you produce? Yeah, so um, I, it depends on kind of like a microstructure we're, cre uh, we're creating. So right now we can basically create um, a, uh, a, a, in terms of like a speed wise from uh, 180 to 600 millimeter per hour. And this is basically in terms of like the speed of like, as you can see here, like things going out. And in terms of the width wise per machine, we can basically produce about 20 centimeter width wide of the material. So basically that gives you a sense in terms of the throughput. Um, yeah. Got it. And, and one final question posted in the chat here. Do you mean that OPT has developed new 3D printer hardware and software? Yes, we have a several patents on our hardware, which is this kind of like a, a, a principle and mechanism of a row to row printing. And the software wise is really about the, how to design those microstructures and make it scalable. Got it. Let's move to the next startup speaker. Thank you. That is going to be Roy Kimura from Modulus Discovery, founder and CEO, by the way. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Um, and uh, I will uh, project my slides. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Roy Kimura. I'm co-founder and CEO of Modulus Discovery. And uh, I've been in the uh, MIT chemistry department a while back as a postdoctoral uh, research scientist. And today I'd like to uh, uh, introduce to you uh, the concept of modulus and, and what we've been doing so far. So the modulus discovery team, uh, we are all uh, pharma experienced R&D scientists, anywhere from 20 to 30 years of R&D uh, experience at Big Pharma, but we all independently recognized in the early 2010s that computational technology for drug discovery had finally reached commercial viability, where the value or specifically the accuracy of the technology became sufficiently high to actually drive discovery programs, and yet the computational cost had dropped sufficiently low to enable large-scale application of these technologies. However, through our experiences, we saw that computational technology was not being fully leveraged to its, its full potential, especially in established companies due to legacy processes. In 2017, the modulus discovery team came together and saw this as an opportunity. And we had a shared vision in mind, and that is to build an organization from the ground up with repeatable, cost-effective, and scalable processes to leverage this computational technology of today. And our real focus is really to discover new small molecule medicines of tomorrow <clears throat> and therefore dramatically improve patient lives. Excuse me. <clears throat> so our unique focus is, is that we don't do low-level programming. We don't devise new AI models. Uh, we don't do any of that. What we focused on is integrating Japan's best process optimization practices with large scale simulation in the drug discovery uh, research workflow. And our goal is to realize early monetization of preclinical assets through rapid and sustainable delivery of clinical candidate compounds while maintaining long-term long upside potential through our pipeline ownership. This is an example of a typical workflow of uh, using computation to drive and accelerate drug discovery. In this particular example, we went from zero, that is uh, no project assets, no compounds, no assays, nothing in place, to running in vivo studies with good uh, lead compounds in about 12 months with only 40 compounds synthesized. In this particular case, we, have, we had identified a very interesting target, a relatively new, newly identified target that uh, had no competition in the clinic and no marketed drugs. Yet there was a publication, an academic or it could be an industry, yes, an industry a, a publication showing uh, actually that this group had discovered some compounds that seemed active against this particular target. 
we went ahead and took that publication and replicated or predicted the activities of those compounds with our simulation platform and compared it against the published experiments, experimental values. And you can see that we've obtained a pretty good correlation. Based on this exercise, we decided this target is suitable for our platform. And we uh, pulled the trigger on a very large scale, comp a 5 billion compound virtual screen. And based on the hits from that virtual screen, we designed 142 completely new molecules with unique core structures at the center of the molecule to both enable um, good IP position as well as good potential PKPD and uh, ADME or um, sort of tox and uh, physical chemical properties of the compounds. Based on those simulations, we were able to identify 10 compounds that appeared especially promising in our predictions. We submitted those to uh, external uh, uh, contract research organizations to actually carry out the, the experimental synthesis and experimental screening of those compounds. Those came back, the 10 compounds, and um, the predictions that we did prior to this synthesis was still very good. You can see the red dots are now prospective uh, predictions. Based on this result, we took the top three chemotypes or compound types, and we uh, designed 168 analogs or variations on those on this uh, three compounds, selected only 30 and submitted them for early lead uh, SAR and PKPD optimization exploration. And after uh, synthesis and screening, we got multiple compounds that were sub, sub 10 nanomolar, very potent compounds. And in addition, uh, in addition, these were already dosable in animals. And so we have now taken these into in vivo studies and uh, since then, we have made a lot more than 40 compounds, but uh, we uh, um, actually um, are very close to uh, uh, getting close to IND for this particular compound. So since 2017, which is when we were founded, we have developed our drug discovery methodology um, using state-of-the-art software and a repeatable, scalable internal process that reduces, in some cases, R&D timelines by up to 50%. We have developed three novel small molecule drug candidates currently in preclinical studies. And in Japan, we have uh, established early discovery collaborations with Peptidream, Astellas Pharma, and Nissan Chemical Corporation. And so far, we've raised approximately 33 million US dollars from leading Japanese life science investors. Moving forward, we are planning a build out and expansion of our supercomputing environment, as well as uh, building lab infrastructure and consider tech transfer licensing of some of our partner technologies. We are planning to increase the number of our lead programs, as well as expand our early stage R&D portfolio based on uh, a set of already internally vetted targets. And in terms of partnerships, our main focus now is to partner these three lead programs currently in, in preclinical trials for clinical trial and commercialization uh, partnerships, as well as forming several additional strategic R&D collaborations with uh, big biopharma and biotech. This is how our pipeline currently looks like. We actually have a number of uh, uh, a larger number of early stage projects not shown here. Um, but the first thing I can say though, is that this, this pipeline is relatively large given the size of our team. We only have currently 14 full-time members and yet we're able to pursue a large pipeline due to the efficiencies of using simulation in our workflow. In addition, three of the projects are very uh, rapidly nearing IND and are currently the topic of discussion in our uh, licensing talks with uh, major pharma and biotech. So our um, main goal for today is that we are uh, interested in seeking strategic partnerships worldwide. We have offices in Boston, um, Cambridge to be specific and Tokyo. And uh, we are interested in uh, forming 
for instance, a platform drug discovery alliance, R&D collaborations, including co-development and option licenses, and global and regional licensing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roy. Um, let's take a question from the audience here. Can this platform be used in biological drug? Um, the answer is in the short run, uh, no, because we that's not in our plans. We are really focused in on small molecule discovery and the, plat the technology is, is especially mature so for small molecule uh, drug discovery. Um, having said that, um, we are very interested in other modalities, applying to other modalities, including biologics, RNA, um, you know, other things, so peptides, things like that. So um, this is something that's within our radar, but I think this is probably the next step after we've established a, a good clinical pipeline. Got it. Thanks so much, Roy. We're going to go to the Thank next you. startup presenter. Pablo Laporta, founder and CEO of 4M Therapeutics. You're on mute. Thank you very much. I'm Pablo Laporta, founder and CEO of 4M Therapeutics. And it's been a, a pleasure to work with Harvard and MIT faculty to start 4M. Steve Haggerty is in the Broad Institute, part of MIT and Harvard, and Liwei Sai is at MIT and director of the Pekoa Institute of Learning and Memory. There's a revolution in neuroscience. It has to do with availability of living human brain cells for research. This was previously not available, but now stem cells can be derived from adults and developed into brain cells, which can be used in research. When you do this, you see that brain cells derived from people with bipolar disorder and people with Alzheimer's disease are deficient in the expression of Wnt proteins. This drives our focus on Wnt, and our founders have found potential medications to enhance Wnt protein expression by screening over 325,000 compounds for their effects on living human brain cells. The Wnt pathway is very important in both bipolar disorder and Alzheimer's disease, and there are several lines of evidence supporting this. In bipolar disorder, the evidence is in cells, in animals, and genetic studies. But most importantly, lithium enhances the expression of Wnt proteins, and that's directly linked to its benefits in treating millions of people with bipolar disorder. In Alzheimer's disease, you have the same level of evidence in cells, animals, and genetic studies. And lithium has been associated with a lower incidence of dementia. We can do better than lithium. It's often given at doses of more than 1,000 milligrams per day. At such high doses, it causes side effects, particularly to the kidney because it's a metal. If you can develop a medicine that enhances Wnt protein expression without lithium, you could have a safer drug that could help millions of people. Our focus is on the 4MTO1 series, enhancers of Wnt protein expression that inhibit an enzyme, GSK3 beta. These are 10,000 times more potent than lithium, and they are not hitting other enzymes. Now, it can take a lot of investment and years of effort to get to this stage of development. We're already there. With a unique pipeline and potency and selectivity that has not been reported. The Form T01 series came from the efforts of our scientific founders and scientific advisors. It was developed entirely with research on living human brain cells, with a focus on enhancing Wnt protein expression, and it achieved very, very high potency. There's an example of a large pharmaceutical company that tried to develop an inhibitor of the same target. They started with cells from mice and then moved on to rats. And their focus was always on 
a protein involved in Alzheimer's disease. They never achieved this profile. A different approach led to a different profile. It reflects the scientific experience and hard work of our founders, but also the power of stem cell technology and neuroscience discovery. Japan is important because bipolar disorder is as prevalent there as in the US, 2% of the population and 1 million people have Alzheimer's disease due to an elderly, a, a, an elderly aging population. Also, Japan is a leader of stem cell research. Shinya Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the production of these stem cells. IPS Academia Japan produces these cells. IPS stands for Induced Pluripotent Stem Cells. Their stated mission is to leverage stem cell technology to improve, to, uh, to benefit humanity. And they are at Kyoto University. We have contacted them and we are going to use their cells in our compound optimization. So we have been speaking to companies about potential collaborations. The discussions have ranged from supporting our chemistry to enhancing our work with stem cells and even to helping develop a US presence for an Asian company in clinical development. We're open to these discussions and Japan is important because our products are important to Japan the technology is strong in Japan, and Japanese companies appreciate its potential. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paolo. Could you expand a little bit about your technology, uh, specifically how it relates to the opportunity for corporates? What do you mean the opportunity for corporate? How, how would you work with them? Yeah, so when we've spoken to a company about uh, chemistry, we've talked about a scientific collaboration where their chemists work on optimizing our compounds that we test in these uh, brain cells derived from stem cells. So that's one opportunity. Another opportunity in terms of enhancing the stem cell technology, we're interested in obtaining more cell lines and cell lines from patients. And there are several organizations that can do that. And we've also spoken to a companies involved in artificial intelligence to analyze the characteristics of our stem cells to rapidly provide a, a, a way of optimizing our compounds. Got it. What about um, the regulatory authorities in Japan? Have you had any conversations with them? Anything you can, you can share? Yeah, I used to be a vice president at Bristol Myers Squibb developing an Alzheimer's disease treatment. And that experience took me to Tokyo to interact with PMDA. I was very impressed by the willingness of PMDA, PMDA to work on Alzheimer's disease. And I think that's a, a priority in Japan. Got it. Okay, with that, let's go to the final startup presenter. That is going to be Bobby Brook Herrera, co-founder and chief science officer at E25 Bio. Hello, everybody. My name is Bobby Brook Herrera. I'm, I'm the co-founder of E25Bio. I'm actually one of three co-founders. We were spun out of Professor Lee Gerke's lab at MIT. At E25Bio, we develop sophisticated yet simple rapid tests, which are integrated with our digital platform for real-time data capture and sharing. It is my pleasure to introduce our company to you. Our mission at E25Bio is to develop best-in-class technologies that enable rapid detection of infectious diseases. Our goal is to develop tests that can be used by anybody, anywhere. The current testing infrastructure, as seen on the picture at the top, is crippled with high dependence on centralized labs, leading to massive inefficiencies and delayed results, thus contributing to the spread of disease. This is something that I've um, warned about for many years. And unfortunately, we've experienced uh, public health catastrophe with COVID-19, 
with now more than 300 million infections worldwide. Um, it, in contrast, as seen in the picture below, E25Bio aims to bring testing solutions directly to you in the privacy of your own home. Our proprietary science powers two types of tests. The first test, which is sort of described on the far right, is our platform, um, which involves direct antigen rapid tests. These type of tests use monoclonal antibodies, which we develop in our laboratory. Um, we use a high throughput screening platform to identify monoclonal antibody pairs. So antibodies that work together and using nanotechnology, we combine the monoclonal antibodies with nanoparticles to detect viral proteins. We have done this for a number of mosquito transmitted viruses, including dengue, Zika and chikungunya virus. These, virus, uh, these viruses are notorious through the, throughout the tropics. In the middle is AmpliFast, our newest and cutting edge technology, which is not to detect proteins, viral proteins, but rather AmpliFast detects nucleic acids, thereby expanding um, our targets outside of infectious diseases. And then both of these platforms we visualize the results on a simple lateral flow test as, as shown on the left side in a, in a cartoon format. These lateral flow tests are easy to manufacture. They can be scaled to the millions and millions per week um, and, and can, be visually, can be visually read, but also read by a mobile phone application, such as the ones that we are producing. Um, so here on this slide, it, it describes a little bit about AmpliFast in, in more detail. AmpliFast is a PCR alternative. PCR is considered the gold standard. For those who, who, who know or may not know, PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction and is typically the clinical gold standard for infectious diseases. However, we say AmpliFast is fast, but how fast? So shown here in, in the top, middle top, um, is, is a test for Lyme disease, which is transmitted by the deer tick. At position number two is, is the test result. And you can see um, a, a band appear at position two optimally between 10 and 20 minutes. So we are able to amplify um, uh, nucleic acids from the, from the bacterium that causes Lyme disease in as little as 10 to 20 minutes, so very fast. We also say AmpliFast is sensitive, but how sensitive? So on the bottom portion of these results is a test for a sexually transmitted infection known as chlamydia. And so similarly, instead of doing a time course, this is rather a, a, course, um, a, a course experiment where we're titrating the amounts of bacterial copies. And so what we can see here in as little as 10 to 100 copies, we start to see a band appear at position two, meaning we're able to detect chlamydia tractomatis, the bacterium that causes this, this sexually transmitted infection, down to um, between 10 to 100 copies. How does that compare to the gold standard PCR? I'm putting down here Abbott. Abbott is a large um, biotech company. It's sort of notorious around the world, um, uh, around the world with many PCR assays. Their limit of detection was 320 copies. So in as little as 10 to 20 minutes, we are able to detect um, infections. In this case, chlamydia, as well as uh, a deer a deer tick uh, bacterial infection known as Lyme disease very quickly and in, and in a sensitive manner. Um, <clears throat> E25Bio is on track to disrupt the diagnostic industry. Last year, we, we got our COVID-19 antigen tests onto several markets around the world. We are no longer investing any more resources into bringing this product to the market. Um, and then moreover, uh, as, as mentioned in, 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 in this presentation, we do have a category known as sexual health, which uses the AmpliFast method to bring tests to the market for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. And then on the bottom half is our vector-borne category, which we're using the antigen-based platform, so monoclonal antibodies that detect viral proteins for these mosquito-transmitted viruses, including dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. Um, AmpliFast however, allows us to bring most common lab tests into the home. And so that is specifically what we're focused on. We want to bring our tests 
into consumers' homes such that people can perform them anywhere and, and they can be performed by anybody. We're starting with the sexually transmitted infections, which is roughly a $40 billion market. However, here on the left side, you can see that um, food testing, veterinary testing, agricultural testing, they're all in all very large markets and all of these can be targeted with the AmpliFast platform. Um, my name again is Bobby Brooke Herrera. Um, if, you, if you'd like to join us in developing novel technologies to detect both um, infectious disease, viral and, and bacterial proteins using monoclonal antibodies and our antigen test platform, or if you'd like to join us for our um, AmpliFlask platform, which again is used to detect nucleic acids, please come and join us. We are looking for partners in Japan in particular for um, to conduct clinical studies. How, we also know that Japan has strong uh, manufacturing prowess. Obviously, um, we, we need manufacturing partners, not only to uh, manufacture the tests themselves, but then also we do have a mobile phone and reader, reader instrument that is able to um, um, interpret the results. And so there's also hardware manufacturing that is going to be important as we move forward and bringing these tests to market. And then obviously the last, the last um, point that I will end on is on distribution. So um, one, one way that we have worked with during the COVID pandemic is working with local distributors in local countries, asking them to partner with us and then help us bring those products into their markets as well. So again, it's, it's been my pleasure to introduce E25Bio and our, tech, and our infectious disease diagnostic technologies to you. Happy to answer any questions. Great. Thanks, Bobby. Let's take a couple of questions from the, from the audience here. For AmpliFast, do you, need, do you need sample preparation for getting DNA, RNA to check infection? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, the, the ultimate question is, yes, you do need sample preparation. However, it all occurs in a handheld device that we are, are building out um, currently. So as I mentioned, we are building a handheld device that allows AmpliFast to um, extract the DNA or RNA, perform the nucleic acid amplification, and then interpret the results. All of that will occur in a handheld device, and that is something that we're currently working on um, in developing. And then obviously we will need manufacturers to scale production of the test itself, but also the hardware. Got it. One more here. What is the most unique technology in your AmpliFast PCR enzyme? Um, it's it's also a great question. So um, for for the biochemists and the molecular biologists or those that um, have sort of t um, experience in these fields, um, PCR is run by um, a number of enzymes as well as master mixes. However. Um, AmpliFast, it is, it's powered by four enzymes and E25Bio has spent a lot of our, um, the past year, I would say a little over a year now, working on developing novel enzymes that power the AmpliFast reaction. And so these enzymes, there's a patent pending on the enzymes themselves. They are completely novel. There are no commercially available enzymes like these and the benefit what is unique about these enzymes is they allow us to amplify the nucleic acids at an ambient temperature far lower than any lamp-based test for those that are in, for those that are familiar with loop-mediated isothermal amplification, which uh, typically the reaction occurs at 60 degrees Celsius or any CRISPR-based detection method for isothermal amplification. So AmpliFast is far, far lower. We're talking about reactions occurring um, anywhere between 30 and 40 degrees Celsius. So far lower, thereby simplifying that handheld device um, and making it easier um, to, to essentially perform these reactions um, in, in one's home. Got it. Um, we're, we've run out of time and I think we're even a little bit behind schedule here. So we're gonna end, um, end now the startup presentations. And now we're inviting all of you to come to the breakout room sessions to engage directly with the startups and ask your questions directly to them. I'm gonna post the link to that Zoom, um, Zoom meeting where you can attend the breakout rooms directly in the chat now.
So all you have to do is click on that link and that will take you to a new Zoom session where you can then select a breakout room that you want to attend. So thank you everyone for attending. It's been great to uh, be able to do this virtually. Hopefully next year we'll be in person.